Hi, welcome to First Friday's Conversations with Archivists, produced by the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections at University Archives, which is part of the University Libraries at UNC Greensboro. My name is Beth Ann Kelsch, and I am host of this series of discussions about collections, campus, and community. Today, we are featuring uh, my colleagues, Carolyn Schenkel, who works with Rare Books, and Suzanne Sawyer, a preservation and manuscript specialist. And they're here to talk about their brand new exhibit, Pattern in Play, Forms of Herbert's Poetry and Shaping the Book Arts. So hello, Carolyn, I'm gonna start with you. So who is this Herbert guy and why did you do an exhibit of his work? Well, this seems to be the year for Herbert. Um, not only that, but actually his birthday is April 3rd. So this seems to be fortuitous time to do it. Happy but birthday, he, George. There you go. Um, but he's gonna be widely featured in UNCG's research magazine. Uh, Dr. Chris Hodgkins has gotten, has earned another NEH grant to work to digitize his materials and do a um, new edition of his works. So this just seems a fantastic time to highlight George Herbert, show how he was influential in English literature. And frankly, it's been um, 14 years since we've put these books on exhibit. Wow, that's great. So it's about time. <laughs> All right. So um, this is a conversation between his books from the 17th century. Mm -hmm. and uh, some modern artist books. So I'm going to ask you to maybe start us off, Carolyn, with uh, some images and kind of walk us through the exhibit. Absolutely. I think my colleague Suzanne is going to, yep, here she goes. All right. So the name of the um, exhibit is called Pattern in Play, Forms of George Herbert's Poetry and the Shaping of Book Arts. And I need to make a plug for a upcoming event in our speaker series, which we highlight. There we go. Uh, Dr. Hodgkins is going to provide us with a presentation titled, I Want Books Extremely, George Herbert and the Soul of the Library. And let me stress that Dr. Hodgkins is the Herbert scholar. I am what I would, am going to call myself as a Herbert enthusiast. So um, please tune in next week and come to this one if, if you want that high level of Herbert scholarship. I'm going to be focusing on one particular poem in particular and kind of how it has influenced um, typographical layout of the book in the book arts. Here we go. So to understand the significance of George Herbert, you really need to place him in his historical context. Um, I've, right here on this slide, I've got sort of a very abbreviated breakdown of significant moments in his life. Born April 3rd, 1593, he's born in Wales. Um, he comes from a very prominent family. And his mother becomes one of the most significant people in his life. She turns out to be um, a very strong and capable woman, might be considered un unusual for the time. His father dies early on, dies in 1596, and his mother moves the whole family towards London because she wants her children to become educated. So yeah, in the year he's born, the theaters in London, they close to an outbreak of the bubonic plague. That's gonna keep showing up for a while. Um, Christopher Marlowe, that's the year he's murdered. And that's the year that Shakespeare publishes Venus and Adonius. Um, by the time he's admitted to the Westminster School, which is the one he attends before going to Trinity College, uh, that's the same year of the gunpowder plot. So there's a lot of things going on in Britain at this time, so a lot of upheaval. But while a student at Trinity College, uh, the King's James Bible is published in 1611, and the year he graduates is the same year that Shakespeare dies. So, um, he does graduate at the age of 23, and he earns both his bachelor's and his master's. He goes on to become the orator at Trinity College. Um, and then in 1627, one of the most influential people in his life dies, and that's Magdalene Danvers. That was his mother. She had remarried. 
Um, John Don, who had been his guardian and is, was considered the most metaphysical of the metaphysical poets, um, provides the eulogy for his mother. And then between 1629 and 1630, he enters the priesthood. This, of course, is the Anglican Church, not the Roman Catholic Church. He marries uh, Jane Danvers, who is a cousin of his stepfather, and he earns a parsonage. He's appointed the rector at Bemberton. Um, George Herbert was not known for ever being in good health. He was always had some sort of health ailment. There was always concerns about money, and his diet was probably not the best. Um, and the rectory where he lived, also he did a lot of improvements to it, but it probably was a little damp, to be honest with you. So he dies when he's 39 years old. Um, he dies of consumption. On his deathbed, he gives his manuscript of the temple to his good friend, Nicholas Ferrer. Um, Nicholas Ferrer will show up elsewhere. He was one of the backers for the Jamestown colony over here in the Americas. Um, so this kind of tells you what kind of circles he ran in, ran in. And the portrait you see over here to the side is from one of the early editions of the temple. So just got to let you know, Herbert didn't invent shape poetry. Um, this concept preceded him by over two millennia. One of the better known practitioners in the classical period um, of this poetic form was Simeus of Rhodes, who flourished around 300 BC. So the concept of shape poetry has been with us for a really long time. Um, Herbert would have learned about Simeus of Rhodes because Trinity College Library had um, 16th century editions of that Greek poet's works, and at Herbert being classically, classically educated would have been able to read them in the original Greek. Um, he may have even recalled this particular form when he was composing his own poem, Easter Wings. So we've got a little bit about Cambridge University Press. This is going to play into what's going to happen. Cambridge University Press was one of the two presses outside of London that had a letters patent, which means they had permission to publish. Otherwise, all other publishers were located in London and all the works had to be approved. Um, there was a lot of censorship at the time. There was a lot of political um, upheaval. So there was a lot of oversight. Uh, those patents that were issued to the University of Cambridge, they were issued in 1534, but the first book ever published in Cambridge was published in 1584. This particular document states that the st stationers have incontestable power to print all manners of books, provided that they are approved by the university. In doing so, it laid the foundation for a system that still continues today. Cambridge University Press is still publishing tons of materials. Um, and keep in mind that Cambridge did not have the level of political intrigue that was found in London. And so often the publications were not as closely scrutinized for treasonous content. And the number of printing projects would not have been as numerous. Um, as those for publishing houses out, based on, out in London. And this allows for a little more creativity from the printers. And the two printers that are mentioned here, the ones that we need to pay attention to are Thomas Buck and Roger Daniels. And you can see that Thomas came on board in 1625 and Roger shows up in 1632. We can go to the next. So what you're looking at uh, on this page is images from the Williams manuscript of Herbert's poems, Easter Wings. And you can see here that Herbert had already conceptualized these as a shape poem. Um, you do get a sense of a wing from the way that he composed these works. It's longer, shorter. So that's the first thing that, that you see. And these images are courtesy of the Digital Temple, and I encourage anybody who's more interested in the Herbert to um, explore the Digital Temple. So let's go on to the next one so we can see 
There we go. This is the title page of the first edition that shows both of the printer's names. And Thomas Buck and Roger Daniel, there they are. They're showing as much of their name as they can on this title page. They are very proud of their work here, and they should be. They set, they took that manuscript and they have now set it in type. We can go on. All right, so now you've seen the manuscript, you saw what, um, how Herbert had visualized his own poem, but what you're seeing in front of you is images from that first edition. And this is Thomas Buck's and Rogers Daniels interpretation of Herbert's textual layout for Easter Wings. On the first encounter with this poem, what strikes the viewer is how the printers envisioned the gutter of the book as if it was the body and the wings are emerging from that body. And for the reader, this orientation of the text alters the whole reading experience. I mean, it's, it's vertical. Um, the blue arrow indicates the first line of the poem. Lord who createst man and wealth and store. The red arrow indicates where the catchword is. I mean, we don't see catchwords in our modern books, but the catchword is the word that it's usually the first word of the following page or the paragraph or the sentence. And so at the bottom where that red arrow is, it's pointing to Easter. So, and that's your clue that the poem actually begins on page 34. The yellow arrow is, is gonna to point to the beginning of the second stanza of the poem. But here's the great mystery, and we'll never be able to answer this. There isn't any documentation on why the printers reoriented Herbert's text, or if anyone encouraged them to do so, or what their process, you know, why, why did they do this? This is such a dramatic um, reinterpretation of that text. This was also a technological feat to make the text align vertically rather than horizontally. It turned out to be such an investment of time and type that the type blocks were locked. Um, and while subsequent editions of the temple were reset, all the rest of the text would have been reset, this particular type block was reused for all of the Cambridge editions up to and including the sixth one, which was printed in 1641. There are no other documented situations where set type was locked and reused for that length of time and number of editions. So on this slide, I've reoriented it so that now you can, you can read the poem and right below, I've provided you with um, sort of more modern presentation of the text. So this is how you would have to hold the book to read that first stanza. And you're right, there probably was such an effort that they didn't want to redo it. Um, what's interesting is that the Cambridge editions up to and including 1641, those are the first six. And then in 1647, there is a pirated edition and they did reset. Whoever did that one had to reset it, Easter Wings. If we go to the next slide, you'll see the second stanza also oriented the way you would need to look at it to read it. And if you can just imagine having to hold the book and pivot the book while you're doing this. So you're really having to interact with the text, not only visually, not only in taking in the meaning of the words, but you're also having to interact with the book, having to reorient it in your hands. Yeah, it would make you remember the poem. It, it sticks with you. So I also need to tell you a little bit about, you know, why are we still talking about Easter wings? Why are we still talking about Herbert? Um, this book was just extraordinarily popular. It just was like the right book at the right time. It was read by those who were on all sides of the political and religious divides that were happening in Britain at that time. Um, 17th century Britain was an interesting time to, to live in. 
It had the regicide of Charles I, the rise of Oliver Cromwell, restoration of the monarchy, not to mention the impact of Puritanism on the Anglican church and the settlement of the British colonies. So there was a lot going on and people took comfort in George Herbert's book. Um, it goes through 13 editions, if you include that, if you're including that pirated edition, all within the 17th century. But Herbert's The Temple proved to be so popular that we have this copy printed in 1667 that the prior owner has written an inscription inside of it. And he writes, this book being very much valued by its owner, Abram or Abraham Hall of Aldermansbury, it is requested it may be returned to him should it by lending or otherwise be from home. So if we dig a little bit deeper into that inscription and look at the date, you kind of dig around. Aldermansbury is located in a ward of London called Bazishaw. And it's one of the smallest wards in London. Interestingly, this area was devastated by the Great Fire of London in 1666, right on the heels of a outbreak of the bubonic plague in 1665. So that was a tough place to be. I did a little digging around and did, did discover Abraham Hall. Uh, he was in London at the time. There is record of his marriage to an Anne Burgess at All Hallows, an Anglican church on Byward Street on July 9th in 1661. And you kind of, kind of, you've got to wonder if this was a replacement copy. Did he have an earlier edition? And this was one of the first books that he replaced if his home had been affected by um, fire. So we're going to scoot forward. We're going to scoot forward quite a bit. In the 20th century, just five years shy of two centuries from that first edition, um, was first set in type. Did a printer reorient the text so that it was in a similar alignment as in that manuscript copy that I showed you? And so yes, this one's printed in London in 1927 from the Nunsuch Press. And they are using the manuscript from the Bodleian Library as their um, source. I just want to show you what, how they presented it. So here you have it. This is what uh, Francis Maynall of the Nunsuch Press, he chose to show Easter Wings and he reoriented it from that vertical format to now the horizontal format. You no longer have to pivot the book. This is the first time that you didn't have to pivot book to read the poem. Um, but even if we look closely at this and think back to that manuscript I showed you, he still, Francis Maynard still makes his, makes a printer's choice. He chooses to keep the text to the left of center rather than the right as it was originally displayed in the manuscript. So and also, I kind of like the fact that in this book, he's, he's looking back at medieval manuscripts. He's using the red ruling to show the different areas of the page. Um, and this book happens to be in a tapestry binding. So that was sort of a throwback to binding styles that you might find in the 17th century. But in short form, Herbert was not the first, nor was he the only poet to write shape poetry. Um, but because his book was so popular, going through those 13 editions, all in the 17th century, by the 18th century, went through three more. Um, by the time you get to the 19th century, that's when editions first start to be published over here in the United States. And it, it's just resonated. It, he, his shape poetry becomes the shape poetry that people think about. It did catch the interest. This idea again caught the interest of Lewis Carroll. He wrote a cute little poem called The Mouse Tail. Um, and then it went on into the 20th century where 
there were fewer restrictions of the possibilities of textual layout because they didn't have so much limitations of physical type. And now on that, I'm gonna hand it over to Suzanne. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. It's really interesting. I have to admit, as I was um, invited by Carolyn to participate in this, I didn't really know that much about George Herbert until um, we were doing this. So, um, but that was interesting to hear a little more context of each of the additions. So, though it may be a stretch to draw a direct line from the work of George Herbert's shape poetry to contemporary artist books, Herbert's work certainly represents one stop on the journey from traditional uses of text and book binding to sort of pushing the limits of this form. Contemporary artist books are one of the many manifestations of the contributions of early shape poetry or pattern poetry. So as Carolyn was preparing for the exhibition of George Herbert's work, she had the idea to juxtapose contemporary shape books with Herbert's shape poetry. And to that end, she invited me to pull some artist books from our collection to complement the works of Herbert that are in the exhibition. So in the two vertical cases on either side of the um, door to Hodges reading room, you'll find examples of how artists and authors kind of harness the shape of text and shape um, of the book form to become collaborators in conveying meaning to the reader. So first things first, what is an artist book? For those of you that aren't familiar, um, there are dozens and dozens of definitions out there for artist books, partly because they can take so many different forms. Um, but I think this one by uh, Otis College of Art sums it up pretty well. Simply stated, artist books are works of art in book works of art in book or book-like form. Printed Matter, who's a vendor of artist books, further explains the medium as, quote, understanding a book as an artwork invites a reflection on the properties of the book form itself. The artist book invites us to hold it and turn through its pages. Whether the contents are visually or linguistically based, often a mix of both, physically moving through an artwork implicates notions of sequence, repetition, juxtaposition, and duration. The interplay of text and images, as well as considerations of the printing process and the design of the book, allows for many exciting possibilities within the narrative, media, and meaning that are specific to the artist's book alone. That was kind of a long definition, but it kind of sums up this process. It's interesting too, referring back to what Carolyn was saying about how it was printed, um, how Herbert's poem was printed in the wrong orientation and you had to shift the book. That becomes something pretty normal with artist books where the reader is asked to sort of figure out how do I read this book? So art, artist books can be in codex form and that's probably the form that you think of most often when you think of a book, folded pages attached at the spine bound into a cover of some sort. However, they can also be really sculptural like the two examples that you see on the screen um, or one of many different varieties of book structures or shapes. So these two books are in the um, exhibition and they kind of um, give you an idea of how the artists are really pushing the boundaries of what makes a book a book. So um, following are just a few examples from the exhibition, um, but we hope that you'll be able to visit that exhibition in person so that you can observe sort of the evolution of George Herbert's work as well as the shaping, pun intended, of the book arts. For the Voice is a collection of 13 poems by Russian, Russian futurist poet Vladimir Mayakovsky. It was designed in 1923 and was meant to be read aloud, thus the title For the Voice. Um, the tabs that you see on the right are meant for quick reference to each of the 13 poems. Um, UNCG's Special Collections has a facsimile edition of this book um, that was published in 2000, but the image that you see on the screen is the 1923 version. So the innovative graphic and book design are by artist L. Lizitsky, a member of both the Russian and Western European avant-garde movements. The Museum of Modern Art notes that Lizitsky made significant contributions to the Jewish cultural renaissance in Russia, illustrating children's books, designing journals, and co-founding a Yiddish publishing house. So you can see that Elizitsky uses text to create an image, and by limiting his palette to black and red and just the white of the page, he creates striking compositions. So both Mayakovsky and Lizitsky were known for their complicated relationships with the Russian government. 
Lizitsky, who was born about 200 miles from Moscow, um, created his last known work in 1941, which was a propaganda poster in support of the Russian war effort during uh, 1941. Um, so, I, yeah, during 1941. So I debated about whether or not I should include Russian artists in the exhibition um, due to Putin's invasion of Ukraine and frankly, not wanting to celebrate anything Russian right now. Um, but in my research, I discovered that Mayakovsky was in, born in uh, Georgia. So in contrast to Lizitsky, who was born relatively close to Moscow, um, Mayakovsky was born in Georgia. And I kind of wondered if alive today, um, where would each of these artists stand in relation to Putin's repeated invasions in Georgia, in Crimea, Ukraine? And ultimately, as you see, I decided to include the work. And that said, um, perhaps you can see how Elizitsky's design work may have influenced subsequent 20th century graphic designers, as well as how it relates to George Herbert's experimentation with text on the page. Richard Castellanitz, born in 1940 in New York, New York, is a writer, musician, artist, and critic who self-identifies as a poly artist, a term that he created to describe someone successful in several different artistic fields. He's also a libertarian and an activist. As described by Printed Matters website, quote, Portraits from Memory is a collection of handwritten visual poems roughly arranged to suggest the physical forms of the artist's past lovers who are memorialized through physical descriptions, such as height and weight measurements. What a delight, right? So you may be able to read a few of Castellanos's assessments in this uh, image of his book, such as alarmingly skinny arms, penetrating blue eyes that often do not see, small high breasts, repressed. Castellanitz's 1975 work is an excellent example of using text for both its content as well as its shape. Here he's using text to draw a portrait both literally and figuratively as well as, in my opinion, a clear snapshot of his misogyny as he reduced his partners to his critical assessments of them. It's interesting to note that he created these portraits over many years, and you can see one of the dates on the right there, July 1947, yet they weren't published as far as I know until 1975. Um, and I imagine that, the, uh, that 1975 probably afforded a much more accommodating audience than a 1950s-ish would have. Yes, exactly, Patrick. Um, Kennedy, a Black American artist, is perhaps better known for his large letterpress printed posters of bold statements, often printed with wood type and black ink on layers of overlapping text and pattern underneath. These are four books from, uh, there are four books from Kennedy's African Proverbs series in the exhibition, um, each is in the shape of a snake. African Proverbs from Nigeria, it was printed, this book was printed on a mate paper, fastened at the tail with a bit of leather and a bead, and it opens into this fan shape that you see. Those snakes or serpents have been used to symbolize anything from healing, medicine, power, death, evil. I suspect it's the symbol of wisdom that Kennedy was probably going for in the shape of these books um, for these Nigerian Proverbs. A few examples of the Proverbs contained within. What the child says he has heard at home. A wealthy man will always have followers. Seeing is better than hearing. In this case, the shape of the book helps, con helps in conveying the message of wisdom contained in the pages. And Kennedy takes a leap beyond shaping the text on the page to actually shaping the pages and the book structure itself to communicate content to the reader. In the case of Jessica Poor's 2004 Pharmacy of Crippling Hope, she's abolished the traditional book format altogether and uses a pill bottle and the capsules inside to literally contain the text. The label of the pill bottle advises, quote, take one or two tablets by mouth, take as many pills as you want, you're still gonna die. Poor's satirical reminder to the reader is both a statement on a society increasingly dependent on ph pharmaceuticals, as well as a reminder that life is meant for a living. And if we are constantly concerned about every risk at hand, we lose sight of our own natural resilience. The text contained in the capsules includes such advice as, quote, run with scissors, don't look both ways, eat raw meat, join a gang, have unprotected sex. 
I will stop to interject right here that these suggestions are from Jessica Poor, the artist, and that neither UNCG libraries nor I will accept any responsibility should you choose to follow these. So these are just a few examples of the innovative uses of text and book format contained in the current exhibition, Pattern and Play, Forms of Herbert's Poetry and the Shaping of Book Arts. We hope that you'll find the juxtaposition of George Herbert's shaped poetry and these contemporary works both entertaining and informative. We wanna thank you for joining us today and we hope that you'll let us know if you have any questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Suzanne and Carolyn. Uh, we're running a little late, but I do wanna um, just check in. So where is this exhibit and how can I see it? I can walk downstairs, so, but how can others see it? Sure, so this exhibit is located in the Hodges Reading Room, which is in Jackson Library. Um, it's located on the second floor of the main building of the old building. And we are open to the public 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. Okay, uh, so it's 1231. We want to respect everyone's time. So thank you, and we will be back next month, first Friday. Bye. <laughs>